Well, hello, this is Bishop Spears, and listen, I want to encourage you today. I really want to celebrate all of our mothers, and of course, uh, let me be the first, maybe the second or third that says Happy Mother's Day to you, and of course, we are so thankful for both mothers and grandparents, uh, those individuals who made investments in our lives, and uh, we really are excited about today and trust that the Lord is going to bless you real good. This word that God has given is such a powerful word. As a matter of fact, you can go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. That's a great word about Hannah, and I believe that it's going to bless your life today. I've been really praying over this word, and of course, I need your prayers while I'm preaching that you pray for me that God will get glory from this word. We look forward to having a great time and then stay with us till the end of the service because we've got some great things that we want to share with you. The Lord bless you and keep you is our prayer. Amen. Bless you, well, good morning and blessings from the First St. John Cathedral, 2401 East Berry Street, where Bishop Kenneth B. Spears is our pastor. We welcome all of our opportunities to worship thee. We worship our Christ today. We worship all of our Savior that he might be able to bless us today. Amen. Amen. We bless God again for another opportunity to worship our Christ on this great, great Mother's Day. And again, we thank all of our online worshipers who are worshiping with us today. And we encourage you to sit back. Matter of fact, stand on your feet and give God a hand clap of praise for all that he's doing in our lives. Amen. Psalms 118 says, this is the day that the Lord has made and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Would you join us as we share with you with our mission statement of the First St. John Cathedral to build a ministry that reestablishes confidence in God, the body of Christ, pastors and our preachers and the local assembly in the communities where we live, Hebrews 10, 35. This morning, scripture, Psalms 34 simply says, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be here in my mouth. Father in heaven, thank you again another opportunity to come into your house and praise your holy name. Thank you for waking us this morning and starting us on our way. Thank you for touching us with your divine finger of love. Allowed our golden moments to roll on just a little while longer and we come to bless your holy name. Now God as we enter into worship forgive us of our sin and trespasses so that nothing would keep us from your presence. Now we lift the man of God who will stand behind this sacred desk. Speak to him and then speak through him so that your word might go forth and your people might be blessed. We love you today. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise and receive our praise. Hallelujah. Good morning, First St. John family and friends. Hallelujah. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Come on. Let's declare his glory. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Bless his name. Let the nation of God be here. Come on. Let the nation of God be here. Come on. Let the nation of God be here. Come on. Let the nation of God be here. Come on. Come on. Come on, let the people of the world be Come on, let the the world be the 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 the
let the nations of the earth let the nations of the earth declare your glory and come on people of the earth people of the brave and not to steal let our living creatures with the Come on, stand this one. We will bring them to you. Let the nations of the earth declare your glory and your honor. Come on, let our people of the earth declare your praise and not just steal. Let our living creatures great and small. With the host of heaven. Come on, stand this one. We will bring them to you. Oh, God, oh, God. Whom shall I fear? 
you have probably already received them by now, uh, but you can uh, fill those out by either mail or online. Uh, please take the opportunity to make a difference in our communities. Completing the census will determine how billions of dollars can flow through our communities for schools, uh, family support, and representation in government over the next 10 years. So do your part and fill out your 2020 census. There should be about eight or nine different questions on there. It should ask you any personal information. If you have someone call you and they ask you for your personal information, hang up the phone immediately. Amen. Yeah, yeah. And so we want to make sure that we do our part in uh, uh, filling out all of our census. And of course today we do uh, recognize this is Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. And it's George Henry. She's going to come and share our tribute to our
special shout out, a uh, particular like today on Mother's Day. I know that perhaps you've already heard it once or twice, but you haven't heard it from me. And so I want to say to the mothers, happy, happy Mother's Day. Bless you, bless you. And we bless you and praise God for your life and praise the Lord for every, every, every area of investment that you make in the life of your children children alive. Then we celebrate because there are, in these days, there are also men who share and bear the responsibility of watching out for children. And, and so we say thank God for, for those individuals who, who do that as well. Samuel chapter 1. Right. It really is a very lengthy text, so I'm going to read a bit of it and then I'll go into the message. 1 Samuel chapter 1, as a matter of fact, verse 3 says, Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkaniah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peniana, and to his, her, all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her. of so 
celebrating who he is. Yes. But then secondly, when we come, we come because uh, it provides a place of fellowship for the body of Christ. I don't know about you, but I love the word of God, particularly when the Bible says that we come and we enter into his house to worship him and to praise him. Exciting time, and I'm looking forward to that place and time when we get back together as a family and a family and a fellowship, and we do that in person. Of course, we want to make sure that we take every perspective and every caution to make sure that people remain healthy and that we do our very level best to follow the restrictions that that we. decision to make today a special day as we celebrate, celebrate mothers. But there was a woman by the name of Anna Jarvis who was one who petitioned, as a matter of fact, it was her work that petitioned so that uh, this day that celebrates the life of mothers would even take place. And so several years ago, in a little church, they had what they called the first Mother's Day celebration. I'm almost certain it was a great, great time because it was a place perhaps where they came uh, and decoratively designed the sanctuary to reflect motherhood. I really believe that that was a special time and place oh, well over 100 plus years ago well, they gave women the honor that they rightfully deserve. It is a matter of fact that I believe that a mother's love really sets the standard for what love is. I think you will agree that there are, whenever you've been loved by a mother or you have experienced the love that a mother provides, it offers a whole different degree or level because mothers provide something that no one else can really provide. And there are so many, there are so many different instances, uh, so many different measures, different designs in terms of makeup, makeup as it relates to women who have played the role, who've been the void, who have filled the void in the life of a child, particularly when a person has needed someone to speak life into them, to encourage them, to lift them from where they were to the place they needed to be. As a matter of fact, a mother's love is powerful. It is a word that is often said, he has the face that only a mother could love. Now that's really a put down. It says something about perhaps uh, how distinctive a person's face is that only a mother could love that. But it really says that no matter who you are, no matter how many mistakes you made, there is something that is unique about the love of a mother. As a matter of fact, uh, if we will agree that uh, from ages I think probably from zero to preteens, 
our mothers are the greatest people in the world. When we became teenagers or you become a teenager, you start questioning what your mom or your mother may or may not know because you think you have all of the answers. And then you get into that place, particularly where you need a mother's guidance. You need that mother to say something or speak life to you. And then there is another place, and that's where many of us are today. Even as we celebrate our mothers, as we celebrate women who made great strides and great advancements in our life and investments in our life, there are those of us who mourn today because of the loss of a mother. We miss them. We miss conversations. We miss times that we have with them. What is interesting about 1 Samuel, I want to cut you in on my development in terms of my thinking, particularly as it relates to the sermon today, but really uh, my development as it relates to preparing a sermon has always been on the time of prayer, asking God for a specific word as it relates to the coming week. Uh, this week, as I was praying, I knew that when I finally discovered that it was Mother's Day uh, today, I needed to put some extra time in because I was preparing to preach something else. And I wanted to make sure that I was, I was in, vain, in the right vein as it relates to sharing a word that would help to lift and encourage mothers. And so... We were in a place of time and celebrating our 50 days of prayer. And so I began praying about a text that would reflect prayer. In the process of praying about a text that would reflect prayer, I also came across a woman by the name of Hannah who was a starch prayer. When you discover, you begin to look, as a matter of fact, in our text, 1 Samuel is a book of the Bible that is developed around three great men. When you look at 1 Samuel, uh, there is a word in there about Samuel. There is a word about Saul, but then there is a word about David. What is interesting is that God in his effort of having 1 Samuel written centers the time and the attention upon these great men who play a great role in life in terms of God's usage of them. But what is interesting is that in order to begin the writing of 1 Samuel, God uses the story of a great woman. It's powerful because what the text develops is that Hannah, who's in a place like so many women in terms of infertile, Hannah has a spot of place in history where God uses her in a major way. Now let me pause and share with you. I've been preaching now 39 years and because of the weight of the text, I've always had a challenge preaching from 1 Samuel. One of the reasons I've had a problem is because uh, when you begin to talk about infertility in the life of a woman, it is a painful subject and it's not a, it's a very sensitive subject. And so when God began to show me the text, over 30 years ago as a young preacher, it prepared a level of weight upon me. And yet God says, I want you to deal with the text because it has much to say other than just she had an issue with infertility. It was something about Hannah's prayer life. It was something about her persistence, something about her devotion to God that made her great 
and the capacity of what God is able to do. And the first thing God showed me in the text is that God is able to cause a, a reversal. Preach, Bishop. That God can reverse some things in your life that seem to be permanent, but God can cause a reversal in your life so that what has been scornful or ridiculous or perhaps even humiliating, God can cause it to reverse so that it ends up blessing you instead of ridiculing you. I got the looking at this text and God says, you've got to deal with this because there are some great women that have done major things in life. But at the start of their life, they started with a scorn. They started with ridicule. And yet God says, I turned some stuff around and began to work in their favor. When you look at this text, it's powerful. I'm sorry that it's taking so long to unpack it, but these truths that I share are necessary in order for you to understand where I'm going because Hannah faced added heartache. She's in a place where she is ridiculed, she is humiliated, and she deals with this place of infertility, but now to add uh, pain and injury to her situation, she has another woman in her life who's married to her husband who ridicules her about her condition. And yet the Bible says Hannah refuses to fight back or to lash back out at her. And because of her sincerity, uh, specifically in terms of her prayer life, God does some unconditional things in her life to make her life a blessing rather than a curse. I got a feeling today that if someone is tuning in that you've got some stuff that's going on in your life and you need to know that God is as good as reversing some things to make your life better than he is allowing you to remain in your worse or your bad condition. And so I want to talk today from this text on the marks of a great mother. Let me labor with it if you will. The first thing I want to share with you is that the mark of a great mother is that a great mother is not void of great problems. That if you're going to be used by God, you got to get ready because problems will become a part of your life. As a matter of fact, uh, when you search the scriptures and you examine the text and you begin to exegete and you begin to internalize who it is that God is using, the Bible is littered, it is peppered with people that have had bad starts, uh, but they ended out on the other end giving God glory. When you read the text and you read about the woman who had the issue of blood, who went around bent over, bleeding, unable to find a healing until she was able to touch the hem of his garment. She was only made better because her faith never gave up. Somebody ought to help me. We read in the text, the Bible says even the woman who spent time at the well went to the well to draw water and ended up meeting Jesus. And when she met Jesus, he told her all about her life. She became one of the awesome evangelists or prophets in terms. She says, you ought to meet this man that will tell you all about your life. And she gave God glory because God was able to tell her who she really was. What I'm trying to suggest is that every great woman that God uses are people who initially have great problems. 
When you look at the text, the Bible says in the first place, Hannah had a great problem because she was infertile. Let me share with you that ever since God shared that text, it becomes a powerful piece because there are people in the body of Christ who are not just physically in terms of infertile, but there are people from a spiritual standpoint that they're unable to reproduce, and it's all because of their position, position in terms of never putting themselves in the way to be used by God. Saved, but never used by God. Saved, sanctified, but never in a place to be used by God. And there are times when God wants to use you, but because of our unavailability, we'll never sing to the Lord, here am I, use me God, whatever you want to do. As a matter of fact, we have a habit of putting limits on what we will allow God to do in our life. The Bible says that year after year, Echaniah went up from his hometown to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Whenever the day came for Echaniah to sacrifice, the Bible says he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peniana, to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion that word is interesting because uh, Hannah's second problem was her husband. Her husband, because he provided a rival in her house. So she has rivalry. That, it's amazing that in the Christian community, we have rivalry. That we have to fight against people who are in the family of God. Sometimes, even in the body of Christ, we are unable to be as productive as God wants us to be because we have people in the body of Christ who take cheap shots at us. Somebody ought to help me in here. The Bible says that Hannah's womb was closed and her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. That's what the Bible says. And isn't it amazing that in the body of Christ, whenever people discover the anointing that is on your life, that there are people who will provoke you, who will irritate you, and they do everything within their power to cause you to want to quit God and quit the church because God is using you at a different level? Preach, Bishop. You would think that when we get saved that everybody would be on the same team, but not so because when people began to see God's spiritual anointing and power that is working in your life, People will irritate you. They will become a rival to you in order to try to get you to quit or to stop doing what you're doing for the kingdom of God. But I want to encourage you because whenever you discover that you have a rival in the kingdom of God and that there are people who are irritating you because of the anointing in your life, press in. I said press in. The Bible says whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her to tell her and the Bible says she kept on weeping and she did not eat because what happens is that the enemy has a strange, compelling way to work on the mind of people that God is using for a greater good. I never even thought, as a matter of fact, nobody ever thinks that because you do ministry and because God is using you at a great level that you will have people who will irritate you, who will bother you, who will make light of the anointing that is on your life. You've got to make up your mind that whenever God has anointed you for a greater work, you cannot allow 
the underbrush to cause you to be swept out of the way. As a matter of fact, whenever you discover the anointing of God on your life, you got to keep moving forward. And watch this. The Bible says what she discovered was that her rival, the person irritating her, was in her own house. So she had, she had a great problem. She had a great problem because she experienced infertility. She had a great problem, secondly, because she had a rival. But then thirdly, she had a great problem because her husband tried to satisfy her with food. He gave her a double portion, the Bible says, of food to satisfy her as a substitute for his love. To prove his love, he said to her, I'm giving you a double portion. She, and what he was really saying is that uh, what are children to me? You got me. Help me preach, Lord. Because the most dangerous thing is for us to put ourselves in the way or in the place where God deserves to be. What Elkaniah was representing, presenting to Hannah, he says, even if you don't have children, you got me. And the truth of the matter is, it wasn't that he had her or she had him, but it was that she had God. Somebody ought to help me in here because the truth of the matter, if you're going to do great works for God and for the kingdom of God, no one else can be in a place that God deserves to be, that God desires to be, and that God is responsible for being. Nobody else can fit the mold of God no matter who she or she is. Do I have a witness here? And so the Bible says, she, he says to her, what are children when you have, when you have me? Here's the thing I want to do when I transition because I think it's interesting that even in following Christ, whenever you're serving and the anointing of God is upon your life, there is always a place where you feel incomplete. Uh, the text outlines that Hannah's place of incompletion, of non-completion, feeling uh, unsatisfied had to do with the fact that she didn't have a child. Uh, in the believer's life, there is a place where you feel unsatisfied. As a matter of fact, let me preach to you because I believe that one of the things that whenever God is growing you, whenever God has an increase on your life. Whenever God is doing something supernatural with you, there is always a place of dissatisfaction. Because there is a place where if you're serving God, there is never a place when you're completely satisfied. Because the truth of the matter is, we always want God, or you should, want God to get his best out of you. What we don't, however, appreciate is the fact that in order for God to get his best out of us is that sometimes we have to go through some stuff that we don't want to go through. And going through some stuff that we don't want to go through says that what God does, he's allowing us to be pressured on every side and as a matter of fact, there are places when we would rather God be saying yes when God is saying wait. And what we don't always understand is that God is working out his plan in our life. And we've got to understand no matter how long it takes God to get us through the difficult places, God always has a destination that he's trying to get us through. No wonder the Bible said, wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Sometimes God will allow us to be in a holding pattern 
where we've got to wait on him because God is trying to get us to a preferred destination. Secondly, great mothers have, they have problems. But, but the blessing of great mothers is that they have great priorities. So, somebody ought to help me. I got to looking at this text. What is interesting, the difference between an average mother and a great mother, I believe, is that a great mother has priorities. You can be a mother but only be average. Or you can be a mother and be great. Great because you have priorities. Somebody ought to help me. I can already see somebody's quitting right now. Help me, Lord God. But there is your truth. There is an absolute truth because although there are women who are mothers, there are women who are mothers that are only average. And yet there are women who are mothers who are great. The difference between average and great has to do with what kind of priorities do you have. So when you look at the text, the Bible says Hannah's first priority in life is, was her relationship with God. According to verse 9, the Bible says, once when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stayed up or she stooped down and she goes into the temple. I've got to pause and share with you that when I first looked at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 years ago, my, my expertise of what I thought was an expertise began with chapter 1 and verse 9 because it dealt with Hannah praying. As a matter of fact, I was just sharing uh, with uh, the Christian Ed director, Sister Clara, I said, one of the unfortunates is that sometimes preachers have the tendency to look for popular texts. So we miss the development of what God has to say before we get to the popular text. And sometimes we miss what God has to say after the popular text. So the popular text is the fact that she's in the temple and she's praying. The Bible says that Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost in the Lord's house. And Hannah, in her deep anguish, prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And in her prayers, Hannah made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant I'm miserable, I'm in misery, but if you will remember me and not forget me and give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now I don't have time to unpack all of that text, but I think it's important what she did was she made a priority. She says to God, and can I pause and share with you while I'm preaching this, it's dangerous to bargain with God. There are people in the body of Christ who often say to God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. We, we make promises to God that we can't keep. And we make promises to God we never ever intended to keep. All we wanted was God to deliver us. All we wanted was a breakthrough on our situations. And so we have the tendency to say to God, if you bring me out of this storm, here's what I'm going to do. And let me encourage you, because when you start bargaining with God, we are often always uh, uh, liable of going back on our word. Preach, Bishop. And the Bible says she made a priority. She says, I will keep my word. And so watch this. Her priority was that if you bring me through this, if you give me the child that I want, I'll give him back to you. And I don't know how many people I've met in the body of Christ that have made promises to God that they've never kept. 
They promise God, I'm going to give you myself. I'll give you my life. But they never done what they said they would do to God or for God. They've gone back on their word. She had a priority. She said, if you give me a child. Now watch this. The text plays out. The text plays out when Eli is watching. He says, I see your mouth moving. But no words are coming out of your mouth. Are you going to continue to drink and be drunk in the house of God? Isn't it amazing that throughout scripture that whenever people are unable to diagnose or be able to discover spiritual stuff, they always attach carnality to it. Whenever you read in the Bible, preach, preacher, the Bible says even in Acts, when Paul Peter and the others came out of the upper room, they immediately thought that they were drunk as to why they were carrying on the way they were carrying on. She said, no, my Lord, I am pouring out my soul and my heart to God, the Father, because I'm in misery. And I want to encourage you that whenever you're miserable, the best person to talk to is God. Whenever you find yourself in a place of sorrow, the best person to talk to is God. And the Bible says that her mouth was moving, but there was no word that was coming out of her mouth. Every now and then in prayer, we run into places when we're unable to structure or pull together our prayer so we don't always know what to say. So sometimes we go in prayer. We are down on our knees in the posture, but no words are coming out. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that where you've been on your knees. You had problems that were weighing on your shoulder. You had some stuff that your life was going through and you couldn't figure it out. So you got on your knees but to talk to God. But when you got down there, you were unable to communicate to God what was really going on. And whenever you get in that spot, we are trusting God to read our mind and to read our heart because we can't verbally say what it is we want to say to God. And if you've never been there, keep on living because the place and time will come in life when you won't always be able to pull your sentences together. The place and time will come in life when you're unable always to pull your conversation together with what you want to say to the Lord. And the Bible says, she says to him, I've been pouring out my heart to God. Now here's what's amazing is that Eli begins to move in what is a prophetic time. And these are prophetic times that we're living in. Eli says to her, well, whatever you said, whatever you prayed about, I declare that in, in a year, God is going to bring the answer to what you've been praying about. And isn't that a blessing that there are times when people don't know what we've talked to God about, but they give us the word of encouragement that we need to hear so that even though they are unable to prescribe what God has said, we get the word from the Lord that whatever you talk to God about will come to pass. Can I get a witness here? I kept on looking there, and the Bible said when she left the temple, her and her husband on their way back home, her countenance has changed. When she gets through talking to the Lord, she's in a different place. Her mindset is different. Whenever you talk to God and you feel like God has heard your prayer. He'll change 
your countenance. Whenever you talk to God and you feel like God has heard your prayer request, not only does your countenance change, but what happens is that God does something on the inside of your heart so that where you've been carrying around a heavy load, all of a sudden you are freed up from your burden and what was ever going on on the inside shows up on the outside. So whatever had you burdened down, now all of a sudden, uh, where you've been sad, you are happy. So the Bible says they go back home. And when they get back home, the Bible says that Elkaniah and Hannah knew one another. Somebody ought to, ought to help me in here because you can't really, yeah, you can't really have a child if you don't know one another. And the Bible said they had a known one another. Somebody ought to, ought to help me in here. The Bible says uh, in a few months later, she gives birth to a son. When you read the text, some days have passed. And the Bible said it's time to go back to the temple again. I, I never saw this before, but the Bible said, uh, Elkaniah said, come on, uh, let's go up to the temple. She said, no, we can't go now. I need time to wean my son. Can I get a witness? I, I had to look at that word wean. Weaning the child meant was not just taking him off of uh, his succulent of her breast. He was no longer, yeah, being fed milk from his mother. What she was really saying is that I've got to give him some spiritual training. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Weaning him uh, was not just a physical act, uh, but it was a spiritual act. Uh, go on and Google it. Uh, because uh, in that day and time, uh, they understood uh, that if you're going to serve the Lord, uh, you can't just be weaned uh, physically. But there had to be a spiritual ramification. And can I preach by telling you, the Bible said, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they're older, they will not depart. Can I go on and tell you that a great mother has priorities in that she wants her children uh, to have a relationship with God. Somebody ought to help me. Uh, that means you got to train them uh, to know what the word says. You got to train them uh, to know what prayer means. Can I get a witness? Uh, so the Bible says, uh, a few days uh, have passed and she hasn't gone uh, to the temple to praise. But here's the good news. Uh, when the baby boy is weaned, she makes up her mind uh, to take him to the Lord's house. And I never saw it, uh, but let me share it with you. 
she says I'm going uh, to the Lord's house I'm not just taking my son but I gotta take God an offering let me preach right there because there's a lot of people uh, that will come to God's house and never bring an offering there are some people uh, that will come to worship uh, but never bring an offering uh, the Bible said uh, I'm taking my son uh, but I'm taking an offering uh, unto the Lord uh, and the word says uh, when she gets to the, the house of God uh, she gives her son uh, to Eli and she says to him I'm not taking him back home with me I'm leaving him here for the Lord's use can I get a witness and the Bible says she leaves the boy at the Lord's house she has trained him but he needs further training and she gives an offering to the Lord all I've been trying to tell you that a great mother has priorities and priorities gotta include your children I'm watching mothers that don't have their children in mind I'm watching mothers uh, that are raising children uh, that don't have the children in mind. Uh, they want their children uh, to live out their life uh, never ever including God. Uh, but if you want to be uh, a great mother, teach that child uh, something about the word of God. Uh, because the day will surely come when your baby boy and your baby girl is going to need the word of God. And when they have the word and they have a prayer life, they'll give to God. Do I have a witness? The Bible says in chapter 2, in the a whole chapter praising God in her prayer she praised the Lord in her prayer she worships God ain't God alright if you are a mother and you determine to be a great mother you are gonna have some trouble you're going to have some scars. You'll have a story to tell. you got to go through some stuff. But if you know God, he'll walk with you. Anybody here know that the Lord will walk with you? He never leaves us all by ourselves. Can I get a witness when you live in this life? Every now and then, some rain will fall. When you live in this life, every now and then, the sky will get dark. The burdens will be hard to bear. Can I get a witness? But when you prioritize and you put God first, you make the kind of commitment as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Anybody in here made up their mind, I'm going to serve the Lord. Every now and then, you ought to want to see your children shout unto God. Every now you ought to want to see your baby boy, your baby girl, give God some praise. 
Ain't God all right? I'm so glad that every now and then I see my boys praise the Lord. It's a good feeling when your children praise God. When your children shout on the God with a voice of triumph. Can I get a witness? Let me close. I got to go on and close. God has been so good. You got to have some women in your life that will point you to Jesus. That will tell you about Calvary. Can I go on and close? It was on a Friday when they nailed his hand. It was on a Friday when they stretched him wide, dropped him low. He hung his head in the locks of his shoulder. Ain't God all right? He never said a mumbling word. But the Bible says, Mary, his mother was there. Whenever you're doing the work of God, you need somebody that will be in your corner. Somebody that will pray for you. Somebody that will call your name before the Lord. Ain't God all right? The Bible said they laid him in a barren tomb. He stayed in the grave. Wow! Oh, what night? Friday night. Oh, day Saturday. But early, I said early. 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 Sunday morning, he got up from the grave. What oh, power? She praised it. I said she praised it. She praised it. She praised it. Go on, read the text. Chapter 2, from verse 1 all the way through. She praised the Lord. When is the last time you praised it? Come on, lift up your hands. Come on, open up your mouth.
need that's in your heart that adds us to the body of Christ. Maybe you are viewing today. And maybe there's a spot of place in your life you never really surrendered your life to the Lord. I want to encourage you. What an awesome thing to remember that on Mother's Day 2020, you gave your life over to the Lord. I want to encourage you, if that's you, call our office 817 and we'll have a team in place to help walk you through that process of accepting Christ as your personal Savior. I think the first step is to give your life over to the Lord, but then secondly, you need to connect yourself to a church and a ministry that will help to disciple you, help you to grow and mature you in the walk of our Lord. And we encourage you to take a look at 1 St. John Cathedral. We believe in faith that God will make a difference in your life. Come on, right where you are, in your home, wherever you are, give God a hand. Uh, you know, God is just 
as this word says, he said he would open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings when you have room enough to receive. And so thank you so much for continuing to bless the ministry, even sowing it to the man of God. And so we want to continue to do that. And soon and very soon we'll be worshiping together. And again, thank you, Pastor, for that, that awesome word. God bless you. Thank you so much. Listen, I do want to encourage you also, remember to stay with us. We're going to have a special time with myself and Clara Williams. It's always such a fun time. I'm always amazed how Clara Williams is able to take the principles that have been taught and transfer them in terms of teaching for our children. And so I encourage you, get your babies, pull them close in, share with us during that time. And listen, don't forget to share with us on Mondays and Wednesdays. We've been having a fabulous time in that Bible study. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you and give you peace.